It's Tuesday, September 12th. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show presented by Nerd Wallet. It's a hell of a day to talk ball and joining me to do just that is nobody. Because after a wild Monday night football game, and I mean wild in every sense of the word, uh, I had to jump back on the mic hours and hours and hours after we taped the main show with Andy Barons to do a little reaction to what we witnessed. Uh, if you somehow were living under a rock, what you missed was that Aaron Rodgers went down after just a mere sampling, a mere glimpse of him in a New York Jets uniform uh, after being taken down in the backfield uh, by the Bills defense. And <laughs> I mean, the air was completely sucked out of the room as Rodgers stood up fell back down or got back down, uh, laid down, was eventually taken to the medical tent, was carted off the field. Everybody, again, the air was completely taken out of the entire stadium. Multiple people put it that way on the broadcast. You could feel it watching, honestly, both teams. So at this point, Adam Schefter speculated at the halftime that this was an Achilles injury. Robert Sala said just moments after the game that they fear it is an Achilles injury as well, saying, quote, it's not good. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all fearing the worst at this point, that the Aaron Rodgers 2023 New York Jets experiment is over before it even begins. And, you know, for one, just from a football level, it's a freaking bummer uh, because this was going to be, I think, a really fun storyline to track all year long. You could feel the excitement with Rodgers coming out you know, carrying the flag uh, on 9-11. I mean, the air, the energy in that stadium was palpable. The hope that the Jets experienced was palpable. You know, everything was there. It was, this is supposed to be that year where this guy takes them to the next level, where he takes them to where they thought they could go all year long last year while being held back by quarterback play. So if, just on a pure football level, it's a total bummer. It feels weird. And this is the part that's it's tough to record this in the moment. It feels weird to come on here and say all of this stuff and have this negative air when the Bills choked away the game and the Jets were able to capitalize on those mistakes that Josh Allen, that Josh Allen himself was the one that to make. And, and they win this thing in overtime with a walk-off punt return. I mean, an insane finish. It feels weird to have this negative energy, but again, watching Zach Wilson play, I'm struck by the fact that as I'm seeing my Twitter timeline throw out, oh, maybe they talk to Carson Wentz. Maybe they call Matt Ryan. And maybe we get Philip Rivers on the blower, get him off the couch after a year. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? The Jets probably should have thought about that, probably should have addressed their backup quarterback position instead of just having the guy that they were so afraid to run into this season with that they made the very, very aggressive, very risky bet on Aaron Rodgers to begin with, you know, this injury completely withstanding. So now it appears that at least for the foreseeable future, and if I was to bet on it right now, probably the rest of the regular season, the New York Jets will be riding with Zach Wilson. And hey, from a fantasy perspective, from an NFL perspective, we know what that looks like. We saw this story already last year. I mean, Garrett Wilson comes out of this game with the touchdown, but only because he pulled off a pass defense to himself who knocks the ball back into play, an inaccurate fade pass, knocks it back to himself and comes down with it. Garrett Wilson can do that stuff because Garrett Wilson is amazing. Garrett Wilson will make the best of this bad situation because he's that type of player. I know, like throw out the splits and stuff with him as a rookie last year because he was a rookie wide receiver. He's a second year player who's better now, better now than he was last year. So he will elevate himself to some level, but where you took Garrett Wilson in drafts, where you hoped him to go with Aaron Rodgers, he's not going to get there with Zach Wilson. This entire offense is not going to get there. Uh, if you're looking for a silver lining from a fantasy perspective for the Jets, Brees Hall looked awesome. Uh, he probably houses that long run if he's 100% healthy, if he's not coming off an injury. So there is some positivity there, at least, to take with the Jets. But we are back in the Zach Wilson wilderness. And you could feel the lack of confidence in him, the, uh, you know, Peyton Manning and Eli Manning on the Manning cast, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick on the Manning cast. They all talked, they all talked about that lack of confidence and how you could feel it from the play calling. Troy Aikman talked about it on the regular broadcast, how you could feel that lack of confidence and just 
the Jets will adjust from here, but these guys that we had high hopes for, even Brees Hall, like I said, looks really good. This offense is going to have to flow through him again, and he's not 100% at this point. That is obvious, even if he's very good. Uh, Garrett Wilson, he will have to elevate this situation. Everybody on this offense's ceiling has now been taken down a considerable notch. And again, I, I, I just feel for Jets fans. I feel for NFL fans as a whole, but especially Jets fans. I mean, I, again, you're celebrating a win tonight, but you're also doing it with, you know, kind of one eye towards the bleak future. And on that bleak future, uh, look no further than next week when these Zach Wilson New York Jets, I mean, with the 20-yard drop back special, uh, that's the main playbook in the Zach Wilson offense. That unit goes against the Dallas Cowboys defense that put Daniel Jones at the Giants in a locker and threw that locker into the sea, picked it back out of the sea, and put it in a uh, meat grinder, essentially. That's what they did to the Giants. That team faces the New York Jets next on their schedule. I mean, we have so many. We have so many Jets standalone and primetime games coming up. So get used to it. Get used to the... New York Jets, led by Zach Wilson. We're back once again. We know what this looks like from 2022. Whatever ceiling hopes you had for these great young players like Brees Hall, if you had any hope for Dalvin Cook as a ceiling play, and even for Garrett Wilson, as good as he is, as much as he can make things happen on himself, as much as he is on that individual superstar trajectory, the ceiling comes down for all of these guys. And the floor, the weekly floor, becomes extremely, extremely tough to sit on and and lastly here on the bills i mean an all-time an all-time letdown job here all you had to do with a team completely in chaos and you could again you could feel the energy of dismay and despair on the other side all you had to do is play a clean game and get out of there and, and you couldn't do that josh allen pushes it way too much it was a huge problem too many mistakes and they let the game slip away. The defense had that Dallas Cowboys Sunday Night Football, like we can smell blood in the water effect, but the offense lets them down. The quarterback lets them down, and they lose to a division rival on a night where they certainly should not have. So with that, that bright, rosy note, let's get to the rest of the show with Andy here on our normal Tuesday program. It's a hell of a day to talk ball. And joining me to do just that is the one and only Andy Barons. Andy! I got to wish you a happy birthday, buddy. It's, uh, what is this, your 75th or <laughs> 69th birthday? You, you let me know, pal. I am I am not quite as old as the Super Bowl era. I'm a few years shy of that. So, But I'm quite old. I'm very old. But thank you. I, I, I do appreciate that. I also appreciate that the first Sunday of the season is uh, in the books. And uh, not every roster I have is in smoldering ruins. Some of them are. Maybe half of them are, but not all of them. Yeah, I'm just now finding out how much like T Higgins I have, you know, like it's one of those <laughs> things. I always tell pe people always ask me how many teams are you have, how many leagues are you in, whatever. Um, I, you know, it's not as bad as it used to be. I was when I was like working at NFL Network and it was, uh, you know, I was a single guy with no responsibilities and, you know, had <laughs> nothing to do but to accept every invite to every league ever. You know, it was a dangerously large number. Um you know, now it's not quite as bad, but still it's to the point that I'm sure you're sure you're the same way. We're not like normal people like you blessed listeners out there who can really enjoy the the, the whole fantasy football process. Like I can't check those rosters on Sunday. Yeah. There's there's especially the early games. There's no way. So I kind of forget sometimes, especially week one. when I don't know these teams I'm like, oh, yeah, I have T Higgins on two of these like eight teams or whatever. Shoot, I forgot about that. But you know what? I'm remembering it Monday morning. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I've got like you're probably the same way. I have like. I have like three teams that hang in the back of, in the back of my head all the time. And I just sort of, yes. you know, I'm, I'm tracking how they're doing. I don't even have to do it online. Right. Like I have three teams that are like just core teams to me. Um, but then I have like 25 other teams and it's just not reasonable to, to track all of that. Um, but yeah, a little, a little bit more, a little bit more Joe Burrow than I remembered drafting a little bit more of the Cincinnati situation that I remembered drafting. That was really unfortunate. Well, hey, this whole discussion is a perfect transition to our episode here. This is what we're going to do 
every Tuesday podcast. It's the People's Panic Meter. We're going to finish with Andy Barron's waiver wire rankings because I know you people out there need your pickups. We'll get to that. You'll probably get some pickup advice throughout this main segment of the show here. It's the post week one People's Panic Meter segment. Uh, if you didn't catch the preseason version, here's kind of the what you need to know. The show's all about you, the people. So every week, we reach out to you to see what has you most panic heading into a Monday morning about your fantasy team after all the action on Sunday. The best responses are going to be discussed right here on the show. There's a couple ways to submit. If you didn't make it this week, you can submit via the mailbag. You can shoot a written email or voice memo anytime. You can do it during the games. You can do it after the games on Sunday. Remember, that's fantasy mailbag at yahoosports.com. The usual rules apply. Video and voice memos go to the very top of the line. Both of us are also posting uh, on X, the artist formerly known as Twitter. I did it right <laughs> after the Sunday night football game. So you can just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. If you want to get submissions there for the people's panic meter, uh, you know, I'm at Matt Harmon underscore BYB. That's at Andy Barron's. If you want to keep a lookout for those. But again, those are the rules. This is what this segment's all about. So let's jump right into it. And we're going to go to the mailbag here first. And Andy, no one dominated the inbox. <laughs> More than Atlanta Falcons wide receiver, Drake London. A few of the highlights, shout out to Joey M, Kyle H, and Mark P for sending in your panic. But Colin M, not producer Colin, but Colin M took the cake by sending in this video. What's up, Matt and Andy? So my wife is one of the many Taylor Swift fanatics in the world right now. And I thought it would be fun to have her help me name some of my fantasy football teams because that's a popular thing happening right now, right? So one of my teams is named Drake London Boy. And then he goes out there for zero catches and one target. So Matt, how are we feeling about your boy Arthur Smith and what's going on over there in Atlanta? All right, uh, Andy, I don't get the Taylor Swift reference. I don't know where you're at. Uh, as a, I don't know what your <laughs> level of Swifty is, but uh, I'm pretty out of the loop when it comes to Taylor Swift. But I think we get the gist of what's going on here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not actually like super plugged into Taylor Swift culture. I respect it. Um, I'm not super aware of it. I completely get the fretting about uh, Drake London. And I like, I guess the first thing that needs to be said is that Drake London is, is still the guy who finished his 2022 season with like final five games. He saw 48 targets, right? Caught 31 of them. Like the, I know that they have passing plays for wide receivers in the playbook somewhere. Um, I, I know that that exists. It was just like, obviously opening week. He's, he's, Ar he's Arthur Smith. Um, right. We, we know like kind of what he wants to do in his heart. And the entire thing was about the two running backs, right? Tyler Algier and Bijan Robinson both had days, both just absolutely dominated the touches relative to any other position. Um, I can't put a positive spin on your, fourth or fifth round round wide receiver uh seeing one target and not catching it right like that's not i mean i guess i whatever we thought the the floor was for drake london it's probably lower apparently the floor is no catches for no yards um it's a it's a it's i'm not going to say it's not a worry i'm not going to say that you shouldn't panic a little bit um, you didn't, you didn't draft this guy necessarily thinking that you were taking a super high variance receiver like that mm -hmm. early I get it. Um, also, like, shout out to Arthur Smith for not, I mean, he wasn't even, he wasn't even really trolling the fantasy community so much as he just directly called us out and, and said, <laughs> let the fantasy guys worry about Drake London's usage. Um, all we care about is being one and oh, or whatever his uh, Arthur Smithy quote was. Um, he's yeah, going to say stuff like said, that. I don't and, care. I don't care about it. Drake London doesn't care about it. Yeah. All we care about is one and oh. Um, I think Drake London probably cares about it a little bit, but uh, <laughs> maybe not a ton, though. I Because I will point to the uh, Kyle Pitts interview we had on the podcast in the preseason. Um, you know, he was definitely and you know, again, what, is he just saying this on a podcast because it's what you say? But he was very insistent that it's a very unselfish culture there that, you know, he mm -hmm. if the ball goes to Drake London, that's great. If it goes to Kyle Pitts, that's great. If it doesn't go to either of them, but they win the game, that's great, too. He was very much like not concerned about fantasy football at all either. If you if you caught the interview. So uh, Coach Smith is setting the culture there <laughs> in, in, in Atlanta. So I will just say I think that that is at least um yeah, you because know, I, I saw people like your your receiver definitely cares. It, that is part of I think 
not the anti-fantasy part of it, just that like, hey, we all do what we have to do as a part. And by the way, I think that's that is good for teams. It's not good for us, though. Yeah. 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 There's no question about it. Um, But like you kind of knew going into the season that the ideal Arthur Smith game script was going to be almost exactly what we just saw, where like the two running backs combined for 30 some touches and every everybody else is, if not a decoy, at least like a supporting player. But again, it's not going to be like that every week. There's going to be the other the other frustrating thing here, I will say, is that that game was super competitive for most of it. Like the final score might not look like it, but that was that was all like the the whole differential was in the fourth quarter. Um, So we are going to have more games like this. That is definitely out there. You're just really, really hoping that um, it it swings back eventually to to some, you know, like like London closed his season with nothing but like eight to 12 target games. And that had to do with Pitts being down and they didn't have Bijan then. And maybe I don't know, maybe things are different now. Um, I think there's better days ahead because he's such a good player. Yeah, look, that's that's where I come down on this is that I get it. It is the first week of the season and it is so rough to look at that zero. Uh, I sent you a screenshot that someone sent me that one someone I is oh, in my Discord ha- <laughs> had T Higgins, Drake London and Dallas Goddard. Um, I, I have a couple teams with really no Dallas Goddard not not on purpose but I have a few T Higgins teams like I said and I have plenty of Drake London teams so I'm familiar with looking at that luckily they didn't complete the uh the quad fecta there with uh Sky Moore 0.4 as well that would be really really beautiful uh, the, but the so thing I get about it. that was that that could have been like legitimately that might have been like his round three round four round five picks you know <laughs> that's, not, that's not just like the end of the bench guys that was amazing I mean, shoot, it, you stick Cam Akers in there somewhere just for the mega tilt, too. Like, uh, it, that's all very possible. And you might have gotten a decent draft grade out of it, too. Uh, so, again, I get it. It's the zero. It's the first week. It's right away. It's also, I think, fantasy football clearly has. And you can't tell me that Arthur Smith doesn't like to lean into this just a little bit. And I'm on record saying that I like I'm not I'm not trying to hang out with Arthur Smith, but I like the way he calls offense. So, you know, th- th- that was definitely out there. But um Look, I, I, you can't tell me he doesn't like to lean into this a little bit. There's clearly some, uh, I don't know, PTSD with Arthur Smith because of the Kyle Pitts stuff last year. Uh, that that is, is it's a perfect storm really for him to lead the panic section here in Drake London because he has yeah. the zero. He did have. Uh, I'm looking back at it right now. He had two. Drake London had two one catch games last year. They lose to Cincinnati. He has one catch for nine yards. They win against your Chicago Bears. Three targets, one catch, two yards. Now he scored a touchdown on that, but it is one catch for two yards. Uh, he has another game with two catches on the ledger. It's just the fact that he was so uninvolved. And you're right. I think the the reality here is though when where I come down is it's not going to look like that every game, and it's probably never going to look like this ever again. Like I'll take yeah. the I'll take whatever the odds are that Drake London never has a zero catch game the rest of the season. And frankly, the Falcons have an easy schedule. I know you you said it wasn't uh it was competitive pretty much throughout, and and all the concerns about Desmond Ritter remain, you know the case. But you also have to remember too that like two interceptions from the opposing quarterback and Bryce Young, those are always gonna like eat into your fantasy totals, especially yeah. when they shorten the field and stuff like that. They didn't have to do a lot to beat the Carolina Panthers. I know it was a close game, but like again, really never got brought out of their shell. Somebody else will bring them out of their shell. So. I I don't like how I feel about the Drake London thing this morning, but I would say that I'm not panicked about it because he's simply too good. And Coach Smith knows how good this – like I think with Kyle Pitts, there's an outstanding question of, okay, how good – I think Kyle Pitts is a good player. I think the, the fantasy panic about him has generally been a little misguided. But I think that Drake London like really hit the ground running, establishing himself as how good he was a little bit more than Kyle Pitts did last year. So and I, I'm not again, I'm a pro Kyle Pitts. I'm not anti Kyle Pitts. I just think that Drake London, I have such a high opinion of. So I would be surprised if we get any, you know, dramatic rough game like this ever again. Yeah, I agree with that. I can't I can't guarantee that if we were re-ranking and redrafting today from scratch that I wouldn't that I wouldn't bump uh, that I wouldn't bump London down a couple spots. I'm not sure I would Fair have him as a, as a fringy wide receiver too anymore. That was a little bit of it was, it was a little bit alarming. I'm 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 allowing some level of panic here. Yeah, I I think we have to allow it. I think to say like, no, nah, it's no big deal would be misguided. I just have to you know 
I just have to believe it's probably not going to look like that pretty much, uh, you know, ever again, like I said. But we'll see. I'm I'm also allowing some panic on this one. It's just not a lot. It's, it's not a lot you can do about it. There's like yeah. this is one of those things where I say, w- don't be making any decisions under panic here because you can't possibly make a good decision here. Your best bet is just to ride it out and see what happens. Let's move on to the next one here. Another email submission. Cole P sent in this email about Vikings running back Alexander Madison. Alexander Madison was able to get in the end zone today and salvage his week one points, but it's not looking good. He had just 11 carries for 34 yards and three receptions for 10 yards. I wrongly convinced myself this offseason that him being a bell cow could push him into possible running back one territory. I forgot how each time I watched his tape, it's just not there and it's not going to be. There is a world of difference when you see the ball in Jacobs, CMC, Chubb or Tony Pollard's hands. My first thought about this, Andy, is yes, there is a world of difference, and that's why there is a world of difference, but hopefully, between where you pick these fellas yeah. in fantasy football. That being said, um, it's weird to say we're we're a little concerned about a week one run out for a guy who did score a touchdown, and the final points are generally there. But Andy, you made the point in a tweet uh, today or a post on X or whatever we're supposed to call it, you know that the run out in week one for the who else is there guys in week one, Madison included. He's not quite in the Cam Akers territory where, oh, there's the other person right there. But I understand why Madison is kind of grouped in this bunch. Yeah, yeah. And it was the biggest part of the argument for Madison, right? And that was really just a reminder that, like, if your first argument for any running back is there, but there's nobody else, right? Um, They can always they can always find another guy uh, if you don't produce. I I do think in Madison's case, I want to. I want to I want to separate him a little bit from some of the other guys um, because like the Bucks defense has been really good against the run for Mm -hmm. years. Um, So that's, that's at least a factor here. I will also say that nobody else really played in that backfield, right? Like Chandler, I think Chandler played like 11 snaps, something like that. So it's not, it's not a situation like acres where he wasn't even, he wasn't even the number one, right? Like he had the most carries, um, but he, but he played like 35% of the snaps. And while that game was in doubt, it was Kyron Williams and Williams had two touchdowns and ran better and all that. Like that's, that's not the situation that Madison was in. Madison was in a, I don't think Madison is the kind of guy who's generally going to overcome a, a tough matchup. Um, and I, I think you're, I think you're going to have to live with that. Um, it, it was again, a pretty good sign that they didn't lean on anybody else. They weren't, they weren't like, they weren't desperate to get anybody else involved. Um, but he was, you know, you're, I mean, you are, again, you are totally right that he is not Nick Chubb. He's not Christian McCaffrey. He's not Josh Jacobs. Um, that is for sure why there's like five draft rounds of separation between those guys. That's why Madison was taken in sort of the James Connor zone. (laughs) Um, they like, they have a workload for now unto themselves, um, but they are not necessarily like special backs. Heck, we always like years past when Dalvin Cook would get hurt and we would recommend Alexander Madison, we would always say words to the effect of like, he can give you 90% of what Dalvin Cook mm-hmm. can give you. Um, but that that 10% is worth so much in real life, right? It doesn't, you know, in fantasy, we just, we just want the volume. We want the touchdowns, whatever, but um, no, he's not in my opinion. Anyway, he's not that class of runner. Uh, Yeah. And I think if he was that class of runner, he probably wouldn't have been retained on like a two year, $7 million deal. It was nice that they gave him an opportunity to come back and start. And looks like he's kind of, he's got that opportunity sort of locked down, but it, it still remains to be the case that, I think everybody agrees like who he is as a player. I think if you're like trying to find the silver lining here, he d- didn't have a particularly impressive statistical game. I wouldn't say like he, you know, it was a rough matchup against the Tampa Bay Bucks run defense that like you said has been pretty good. And he still came away with a touchdown opportunity because he's still playing as the lead back on a good offense. And you yeah. know, I didn't know there wasn't offense wasn't perfect in week one. I mean, they lost to the damn Baker Mayfield led Bucks. He, <laughs> Kirk Cousins squandered himself a couple of opportunities there great for me saying I've been Kirk pilled or whatever. That was a good way to like get out of that trance in week one. Like, yep. Okay. Right. (laughs) There is, this part is still a thing. These moments are still a a big part of the Kirk cousins equation. So I think if you're looking for silver lining here, it's that there's a lot of negative for Madison in week one, but he still had that touchdown opportunity because he's still a lead back on a good offense. And 
you know, they get the Eagles, they get the Chargers, they get the Panthers, they get the Chiefs, they get the Bears the next few weeks. Like, there are spots in there where I think Madison is going to be much better off. So I actually don't think I'm really panicked at all on Madison as long as you have a clear sort of understanding of who he is and what you drafted in Alexander Madison. I, I will say that I am less panicked on Madison than I was uh, or that I would be about the other running back involved, like on the other side of that game, Rashad White. Um, oh, yeah. He was even less efficient than Madison was, right? It was, it was something like 17 carries for 39 yards, uh, something like that. And he, you know, none of, none of the numbers looked great for White last year. He was not particularly elusive, um, rare, rarely made a guy miss, um, pretty inefficient. That carried over into opening week here. And he just happens to have somebody behind him in Sean Tucker where... I don't I don't know that there's a whole lot of difference between those guys. And and I don't think Rashad White can afford very many more like 15 carries for 35 yards or 40 yard kind of games before they got to they got to start using somebody else. Yeah, we actually had a submission on Rashad White at Ivy Man underscore FF on on Twitter said, I'm not panicking. But if you're invested in Rashad White, I'd make preparations in case he loses his job. He rushed for wait for it, minus 38 rushing yards <laughs> over expectation, minus 3-8, not good. And yeah. undrafted running back Sean Tucker in his first NFL game looked better than him. And Tucker is a guy that uh, is not like a typical undrafted player because he fell due to injury concerns. And I mean, when you posted the thing that the, the post I'm mentioning on uh, Twitter that you know, about about all these mid-round running backs and stuff like that, I think it was Rich Rebar quote tweeted it and said, if you're making a fantasy football argument for a player and it doesn't start with the player himself, then you're in trouble. And I don't think there were a lot of uh, like Rashad White arguments that started with. I mean, actually, most yeah. of the Rashad White arguments usually started with now he didn't play very well as a rookie. But <laughs> and usually if you're saying like he didn't play very well as a rookie, but the but there should be doing a lot more work than the first sentence. So I'm with you that like in, of these two running backs. You know, and they sort of went in the same range of drafts. I didn't take Rashad White once. I took Alexander Madison a little bit. So if maybe these are my biases coming through, but I'd be much more worried about White coming out of this game. Yeah, that is that is exactly how I feel. I'm I'm much more worried about White because I haven't like at least with Madison, we've seen it for a, a game or two. He's you know he's played really well in relief of Dalvin Cook a handful of times. I we we haven't really seen it with Rashad White. Um, he hasn't had like that signature game. He had, a, he had a good game overseas last year, but it wasn't like a it wasn't a wow game that forced his way, you know, to being a centerpiece of the offense or anything like that. So I'm uh, my my panic level about Rashad White would be, well, he, actually, he's he's pretty close to where my expectations were for Rashad White. So I'm not surprised by it. But if I if I had him on a roster, I would be plenty panicked. All right. Next one up here from the mailbag, Matt M has a trio of guys he's worried about in his email. He says, should I be freaked out about Mike Williams, Isaiah Pacheco, Rashad Penny? This one's a great, they're perfectly in order, Andy, to no, <laughs> you shouldn't be panicked about Mike Williams. Two, maybe about Isaiah Pacheco. And three, yeah, you, if you drafted Rashad Penny, you should probably be panicked about the fact he was a healthy freaking scratch in week one. Yeah, Penny, like, Penny's a drop. I don't know. How long yeah. are you going to wait for Rashad Penny? Um, Kenneth Gainwell, like, owned the he did, I just flat out owned the backfield. I don't know, I don't know what else to say. It it might not last the entire season and somebody might get hurt and Penny might have to be deployed and we think he's a pretty good runner when he you know when he gets an opportunity but he like a healthy scratch. Um you got you probably got to move on. You you surely didn't take him that early. So you're not going to feel that bad about cutting him like it was just a mistake. Um use the roster spot. Pacheco yeah, I mean, pretty annoying that like I feel like a lot of people were reminded of the fact that Clyde Edwards Alaire is still a member of the Kansas City Chiefs on Thursday, right? Not that he not that he did anything special, but if Pacheco is going to be somebody who is who is almost entirely about like early down usage, goal line usage, he can't he can't lose any of those carries, you right. know? Like he's got he's got to get it all uh if he's not going to really give us reception. So, moderate concern there and then zero concern whatsoever about Mike Williams. It's a great offense. He's a circle of trust player when he's healthy. He's great. Um had a little bit of a I think it was a concussion scare right on Sunday, yeah, he, oh, but, but drilled, came through yeah. it. You know? So he's so he's he's good to go. I would I would continue to use. I I draft Mike Williams exactly the way I had him, you know, a week ago. 100%. Yeah, Pacheco did catch four balls on four targets in week one, but it was and, and some of them were a little designery too, which I think was nice to see. Hmm, so you yeah. could you could kind of look at that. But 
I think the Chiefs are clear. I almost just say I, I went back and watched the you know Chiefs offense on on film, right? And like you could tell that was an offense that was playing. And frankly, you know, look, I know it's sacrilegious, and I mean, I've literally called Patrick Mahomes quarterback Jesus. So really, sacrilegious. It's it's to say this, but that was an offense and a quarterback too playing as if they had taken their elite player out and plucked him out of the game plan without a lot of notice. That so I almost don't yeah. want to take. And I'm not saying that you should just feel great about Isaiah Pacheco or Sky Moore or, I mean, dude, definitely don't feel good about Kadarius Toney. But, like, I'm not saying that nothing – I'm not saying all is well in Kansas City. I think there are still outstanding questions. But I want to see that offense with Travis Kelsey or at least even, like, a, a full, you know, 10 days to prepare a game plan knowing, hey, this guy's probably not going to be in the mix here before I freak out about any of these players. So I'm, like, kind of mixed yeah. on I, Isaiah Pacheco. Just to un Rashad Penny real quick. Would you rather have been a someone who drafted Rashad Penny or would you and he's a healthy scratch in week one, or would you rather have been somebody and this player was sent in a lot as well on on social, would you rather have been somebody that drafted DeAndre Swift and for him to get like, you know, a bu- basically no work in week one? Yeah, that's a that's an easy answer. And I would rather have drafted Rashad Penny because I probably I probably started Swift, right? Like I, <laughs> I probably got really excited when Rashad Penny was a healthy scratch and I was like, oh, there's yeah. there's no way DeAndre Swift isn't getting 15 touches in this one. And then he got and then he got two and he gained three yards and Kenny Gainwell like dominated the snaps and took all the touches. So yeah, um it pr- it probably cost me a win. Yeah, I said on the pod, I think that I was a little nervous, like, oh, man, maybe I, you know, the Bo Wolf report about they want DeAndre Swift to be the guy like, ah, man, maybe I was too low on Swift. And then he comes out of week one and gets one, two, one, two touches. I think I felt pretty good about that coming out of it. So, all right, next one up here, Kenneth W. Christian Kirk panicked about Christian Kirk. Is it me or is Trevor Lawrence so mesmerized with his new toy in Calvin Ridley? Uh, that who he had for his wide receiver one last year. He forgot who he had for his wide receiver one last year, which of course was Christian Kirk. Sincerely, Dallas Cowboys fan living life like the 90s. Well, shout out to you, Kenneth. If you're feeling bad about <laughs> Christian Kirk, at least you can, you know, just go re- go rewatch that demolition <laughs> that the Seriously. Cowboys, that ass whooping that they handed the Giants. Um, I do think uh, of anybody, uh, if anybody that's in this list, Christian Kirk is pretty pretty tough to to think about right now and and it's a couple of reasons Andy it's not that Calvin Ridley has is so mesmerized with, with or Trevor Lawrence is so mesmerized with Calvin Ridley he is and he does he should be right and we all knew mm-hmm. that was coming and it, it's the right thing for the offense I mean my god even going back and rewatching that game it's just beautiful that that connection Trevor already has so much trust in Calvin Ridley and and it's and Ridley is doing so much to earn that trust. The problem for Christian Kirk is the problem that sort of cropped up in preseason that he was playing behind Zay Jones in two receiver sets. He was out snapped and out targeted by Zay Jones in week one. I think Christian Kirk is a pretty nice player, and you know, but this usage is is really troubling. Despite the fact that it's an offense that I think. We'll have days where they need to come out of the well. I mean, not that they didn't need to come out of their shell against the Colts. That's not right the right way to say it. Things will just look different throughout the course of the year. But I understand why Kenneth is panicked about Christian Kirk, who I think you absolutely cannot start now going into week two. Yeah, I, I that you know uh, you hit the the points that I was going to touch on. Um, Zay Zay Jones looked great, right? I mean, they made the catch of the week. The touchdown catch was incredible. Drew seven targets, um, and I th- I think we pro- I mean maybe that's too great of an overreaction. And obviously Trevor has had a good year with Christian Kirk. I'm sure Kirk is going to have some moments, um, but we very much need to think of him as kind of a wide receiver four right now. I think somebody that'll that'll get you through some bye weeks, and it's a familiar name that you can feel okay about. And I'm sure he's going to have three or four games where he is moderately productive for fantasy managers, but. Um, like R- Ridley looked like his, his old self. Um, and if that guy's on the field, of course you're drilling him with passes. Um, Lawrence, by the way, I thought like Lawrence's best throws were incredible. That guy's got a, yeah. that guy's got a cannon. He was super fun. That was, that was like my, pre- my game day experience is generally like I'm, I'm watching one game and then I've got red zone on the laptop and Colts and, and, uh, Jags was my game and man, Lawrence was super impressive. Lawrence made me, um, he made me go to bet MGM and make a, make a mid game bet on him to win MVP. Um, I don't like, I don't think he's the favorite, but that guy looks so good. Um, 
and and Ridley was so, Ridley was so good. I mean, that was my whole my whole takeaway from that thing was that that it looks like he was just dropped into the uh, to the game right out of like 2019 or something. I mean, he just looked fantastic. So yeah, I, that's a very long way of saying that I think Christian Kirk does have a problem, and it's it's almost more of a it's almost more of a Zay Jones problem because he played an almost flawless game. 36% first read target share from fantasy point data for Calvin Ridley. And again, that's really high. That's up there with like the elite receivers and like Calvin Ridley at his peak can be an elite receiver in the NFL and Trevor Lawrence. I'm with like, I, I, I before the season, I bet Calvin Ridley, like, you know, 40 to one or something to lead the NFL in receiving yards. Cause that is, that potential is, is in there. And it looked, I mean, four catches for 41 yards on the first drive, you know, like yeah. that it's clear that they want to continue and build and foster this connection, you know, and 25%, of the first read targets. That's what Christian Kirk led the Jags with in 22. So it just shows you that, yeah, he had that role then, but he was always going to get usurped by Ridley. But the concerning part is the Zay Jones thing, as you mentioned. Now, week two, these guys go against the Kansas City Chiefs. And I know the Chiefs are obviously coming off a rough week one, but if they spread the field with three receivers and Christian Kirk runs as many routes as Zay Jones in that game, and he's this primary slot guy and he has a much bigger performance, I think you can be 0% surprised by that. But now I think you have to accept a new level of volatility with Christian Kirk, maybe yeah. than, than what you were thinking. Yeah, I think that's that's probably the best way to put it. One one other thing on Ridley, and I know it's not the this person's question, but um, he had like collegiate separation on a, lot of, on a lot of those catches too. He wasn't just like... Well, a little bit open. Well, yes, uh, Calvin Ridley is a, a, a great route runner. Uh, I mean, it, like it, it, at his peak, again, the Falcons days, he was on the Stefan Diggs trajectory of route running. Some of those dudes playing in the secondary for the Colts are, I mean, a little closer to college than NFL players. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. being so disrespectful. And I'm sorry to Dallas Flowers and everybody else and that's playing for Indianapolis. But that is not that secondary is going to make a lot of people look really, really good. I don't think that that is why Calvin Ridley looked good in week one, but it didn't hurt. All right, let's move on to some of our social submissions here. This first one comes in from at one Kumar underscore NFL. The Bengals offense, they'll get right. But that Burrow injury might be far more debilitating than we were led to believe. I mean, Andy, I can't tell you how I knew the Bengals are going to get thrown in here. I knew T Higgins are going to get thrown in here. And it was not a good week one showing. But, yo, I am 0% panicked about the Bengals. I don't know about you, but I'm at zero, zero on the panic meter here for the Cincinnati Bengals. One, they start slow every year. So do all the damn teams that don't play anybody in preseason. A lot of them start slow. Yeah. Their quarterback has missed a lot of time. And most importantly, and can I just say this? Like sometimes if you're sitting here after week one and you're panicked about an offense that didn't play well, please remember that the defensive players are are paid too. And I want you to go <laughs> back and watch that game between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Cleveland Browns. And I don't know how you can't come away with, damn, the Browns defense under Jim Schwartz, right. a new defensive coordinator, just played extremely well on defense. Uh, so I'm not pa panicked about the Bengals. I think the, the 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 lesson here is just that, oh, we might have to adjust expectations for the Browns defense. And like Miles Garrett might be on ready to, to win a defensive player of the year award type of season. Yeah, Garrett was a Garrett was a total game wrecker. Um, the the conditions were sloppy, but we're we're also talking about a team from Cincinnati, and it's not like it's the last time they're going to have to play in the rain. That happens. Um, but we all, like we're we're just running this back from last year. Like we were all kind of wringing our hands. I mean, not maybe not you and I, but like people were wringing their hands about the Bengals early last year too. And I think that I, I don't think it's so much that like the injury is still bothering Joe Burrow as he missed almost all of camp, um, came back pretty late. And I don't know, I, you, you can give him a dud, but like that is a very accomplished pro. <laughs> it's, like I, I can't I can only get so panicky about somebody who has been in the MVP conversation in multiple seasons and has made deep postseason runs. And he's tied to a, an incredible young receiving core. Like, I mean, if you're worried about Joe Burrow having some big days going forward, I'm I'm at the front of the line to trade for him. I'm at the front of the line to trade for for T. Higgins and Jamar Chase. Like, they're they're great. They're not your. They are surely not your biggest problem. They may have been your biggest week one problem in terms of scoring, but they are not your biggest problem going forward. This next one too, I I don't feel exactly the same way because it's not quite the established unit that we just talked about in Cincinnati, but. I th I'm in the I'm not again I'm not in the in, um, in the same house but I'm in the same neighborhood with this one uh, at Mike 
and and a bunch of numbers here says I try not to overreact to things too much from week one, but I would almost say the Ravens offense overall. I don't have any Zay Flowers shares, but he looked like the only one to be excited about. Uh, I wanted to follow this up with I'm generally not. I, like I'm going to explain why I'm not that uh, panicked about the Ravens offense overall, but it is worth noting this team that just has some of the worst injury luck in the NFL. And, you know, yeah. I was willing to say like, Hey, maybe they, they fire their strength and conditioning guy when they get the F minus from the NFL PA report. Maybe they'll have better injury luck this year. Well, coming out of week one safety, Marcus Williams has a pec injury. He's going to be out quote a while. Uh, he's going to decide on whether he has surgery center. Tyler Lindenbaum ankle sprain going to be week to week. Former first round pick, uh, Ronnie Stanley. I mean, my God, that guy's really struggled with injuries. Knee sprain. He's going to be week to week. J.K. Dobbins, of course. I mean, awful, awful. I feel so bad for him. Torn Achilles. He's out for the season. Marlon Humphrey has a shot to return this week. A shot from a foot injury. He obviously has been dealing with injury. I mean, those are a lot of really good players I just listed off. I know only J.K. Dobbins is a fantasy guy. But, I mean, dude, that's a lot of good Ravens players. So, I don't know, Andy, where are you at with the Ravens offense and maybe the Ravens overall coming out of week one? Yeah, first of all, as a, as a short-term issue, like the, the double offensive line injuries, Linderbaum and Stanley are a, I mean, that's a, that's a worry at least for a week or two, right? Um, these, are, these are good players. Linderbaum's a great player. Um, so, that's obviously a problem. The, the pres- presumptive lack of respect for the, the running game, whatever it looks like next week, it's probably going to be some combination of Justice Hill, Gus Edwards, Melvin Gordon probably comes off the practice squad, yeah. right? They, you know, there's it's still a bunch of free agents available. Um, it's it's probably not going to be Jonathan Taylor next week, right? Like, but there, but it's going to be a couple of rogues um, behind an offensive line that's going to be really banged up. So I, I, I will acknowledge that that is a concern. I was shocked at the number of people who actually can't like fantasy managers who came out of week one worried about Lamar. Um, and I, I guess some of that is relative to expectations because you saw Houston and you were kind of licking your lips and you were like, oh man, Lamar has a chance. I thought Lamar had a chance to be QB one um, in a, in a pretty favorable matchup. It, it just happened that the, you know, the touchdowns went to running backs, but I like, if I were a Ravens fan, um, if I, if I, you know, and I am somebody who has a fair amount of Lamar Jackson, um, you can also look at that game and say, wow, however, however good I thought Zay Flowers was, he looks like he might be a star, like, yeah. like not just good, but like Pro Bowl good immediately, like thousand yard good immediately, 1100 yard good immediately. Um, and you also have to remember that you get Mark Andrews back too. So like there is help coming. Andrews was presumably pretty close to playing in the opener. Um, we get him back next week. That's going to make a big difference. So I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't, I'm actually not. I'm I'm about with the exception of maybe worrying about the offensive line injuries going into next week. I'm about where I am with the Bengals on this one. I'm not like if you want to if you want to flip Lamar Jackson, I'm here for it. I'll take him. Yeah, I'm not I'm not freaked out uh, about the Ravens at all, really. But look, I think relative to expectations is exactly right, like you said, because what we do in the off season and look, we're guilty of it. We talk about it on this podcast about how excited we are about this offense and how good this offense is going to make Lamar. But, and all those things can be, and I think will be true at some point, but they aren't always true right away from week one. It doesn't just immediately happen, especially for again, a guy in Lamar who is not going to play a bunch in the preseason. Like it's very different going from practicing in this offense to then playing in this offense on game day. Look, I I think it was time to move on from Greg Roman, but Lamar has played in Greg Roman's offense his entire career. You know, this has been the thing for Lamar Jackson. So, um, It's going to take a little bit of time for this to click. Lamar played in week one, like a guy who looked like he needed a little more time to click in the offense. And you're so right that like Lamar Jackson, I mean, excuse me, you're so right that Mark Andrews is not out there. Rashad Bateman, I know people are freaked out about him. I mean, dude, he was not going to play a full role in week one because he had dealt with so much offseason trouble getting back from this injury. I think the longer he's out there, the more he will play and the more involved he will be and the better that is for Lamar Jackson. And by the way, like, J.K. Dobbins, before he left, bangs in a short touchdown. Justice Hill bangs in short touchdowns. Lamar's just on the wrong side of touchdown variance there. If he throws two touchdowns, even one touchdown, he's not getting named in this column. And and a last point on this, again, defensive defensive players get paid too. I do think that, and I flagged this, I think it was on this podcast, maybe it was on uh, the podcast with James Coe that I do. That Texas 
defense has a chance the, in the pass game to be extremely underrated. Like they might be one of those units that by week five are we've we've flipped from oh yeah the Texans are on the schedule start all your dudes to like oh man you know Derek Stingley's coming along and like Will yeah, Anderson is right. wrecking games you know that potential is there as well. Yeah, no, that's a it's a that's a really good call. Um, and, and that happens with like a handful of defenses just absolutely every year. And it's why we always caution people not to make not to make too many long term plans and not to make too many like uh, really serious like strength of schedule plans, because that sort of thing always blows up. Yeah, again, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with Lamar. I think I think they're going to get this worked out and I think they get like I think the receiving core gets better. And like uh, one more time, Flowers just looked awesome. Yeah, right. Like being upset coming out of week one when Lamar Jackson looks like he's playing with like, again, I love Rashad Bateman. I'm a big fan of Bateman, the player, but like even Bateman's not that type of receiver. Lamar's never had that type of receiver. So, yeah, it's it's just it's pretty exciting, I think, for the Ravens offense, which will be better in time. All right. We've we've delayed this enough. I know it's your birthday, but we're about 30 uh, ish minutes in the podcast right now. We got to do this one at Adam's life. Simply tweets the entire bears team. So Andy, I mean, bro, uh, <laughs> where are we at from a panic meter standpoint on the bears team and notably, uh, the bears quarterback and how that trickles down to everybody else. Yeah, I think we're, I mean, I I've already processed the panic. We were like, I might've been panicky in the first quarter, second quarter. And then I was just resigned, right? Like I've moved oh, entirely man. past panic to certain. How often have you just been resigned throughout the course <laughs> I mean, of your Bears fandom? Is, you know, I'm old. I've been a Bears fan for a long time. And I've like sat through in, so we were talking about this earlier before the pod, like, I, I'm I'm actually kind of patting myself on the back for not going to that game because I've been I've been suckered into that situation before my whole life, right? Where I get really excited for, but like sometimes without without any basis um, for the possibility of the Bears being being a little bit frisky against the Packers, and I get really like you know amped up and I get tickets and I go and then Brett Favre beats us by forty. Like I've 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 done that um, I've done that several times and I'm I'm. I've aged out of it. I no longer put myself in that position. So hat tip to me for that. Um, they, they just got, it's like almost to the point where it's hard. To, like, I want to say some good things fantasy wise about Jordan Love. And I wanted to, you know, I, I wanted to hype him in the pickups a little bit, but he was just unbothered. Um, so I almost feel like I want to see a game where somebody actually heats up Jordan Love a little bit because the Bears didn't. The Bears got destroyed in the trenches like both sides um destroyed like not close not a fair fight um the mercy rule should have been invoked uh it was it was really bad uh bad both ways and we we had a little bit of uh, you know it, fields is a is a different story entirely i'd 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 said a lot about how like i didn't think that justin fields this season, like I, I felt like they needed more layups in the offense for him. I feel I felt like they needed more short stuff, easy stuff, easy completions. They didn't need everything. Like his average depth of target last year was way over nine. That it couldn't be like that again. Matt, it was two point nine. It was two point nine. <laughs> um, he I, like he didn't go downfield at all. The entire offense was built out of screens. Um, there were a handful of opportunities. Chase like, Claypool screens too. Work, oy, like, oy, oy. Breaking like breaking down like some, uh, you know, if there's going to be a handful of opportunities where DJ Moore gets open downfield, the ball's got to come out. Um, but fields clearly not looking there. Fields clearly looking short range the entire time. And that's, you know, that has to be part of it, but it can't be the whole thing. Um, so that was really frustrating. Uh, Chase Claypool, like what a dud of a game. Pro- probably, I-, I don't know if they if they found a way to like just absolutely cut ties with Claypool off of that game, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't bother me. Um, I, there's just not a lot of good things to say about it. They got, they got absolutely destroyed, uh, uh, again in the, in the trenches. And that's, that's an unsolvable problem in season. There's nothing you can do about that. Right. Like it, and it was also tough to watch that happen while, Jalen Carter was just a total game wrecker for the Eagles because that is the other direction the Bears could have gone. So that, you know, that was a that was a tough scene too. You know, if you're just I think the fact that there was so much sort of 
Justin Fields is the next Jalen Hurts, right? Uh, right. He has to he has to be the next Jalen Hurts, the DJ Moore model, and then for it to come out so flat in Week One, and not just that it came out flat, Andy, the way it came out flat, and then when you juxtapose that with the guy across the field in Jordan Love. And I I think Jordan Love, who he is, is still an open question. I'm not saying he's a freaking Hall of Famer right now, but the fact that if you look at it, week one quarterbacks, you know who's number one in EPA per drop back? Yeah. It's Jordan Love. And I got to scroll down and down and down and past Ryan Tannehill and past Desmond Ritter <laughs> and past Sam Howell before I finally arrive at number 23 Justin Fields, just above Bryce Young, uh, you know, the, the, to get to where he was in EPA per dropback. So I think it's the juxtaposition there that's just, I mean, if you're a Bears fan, I totally get why, why you, you know, drowned yourself in booze last night and like are just feeling awful going into today. And from just a fantasy angle, like people, people t- replied a lot with Justin Fields on Twitter and said, like, yeah, I'm, I'm pissed that. Like I'm panicked about Justin Fields and I could have just drafted freaking Tua, you know, multiple rounds later or right. something like that. Yeah. The other, um, I mean, there's, there's no shortage of things to be frustrated about as a Bears fan. One of them, you know, like Fields still had his moments where the, the, you know, he scrambles and the game briefly turns into a cartoon and he's, you know, he's dodging people left and right. But man, there was any, any time you got a glimmer of hope, like mid play as a Bears fan, there was a flag and not, not a questionable flag either, but like a deserved flag. Um, so just the combination of penalties and, and just immediate losses, the number of like the number of free rushers that were coming at fields looked just like the year before everything that you hated about the bears offense, you know, at the, at the start of 2022 was, was right there for you at the start of 2023. So that was disappointing. Um, I have, I, I mean, I don't have, I don't have any silver lining coming out of that game. I don't have, I don't have anybody to hype. Um, I don't have anybody to tell you to go add. Um, I've seen people try to make the case. Oh, wow. Roshan Johnson came on late. Well, the game was decided. Um, and he, and he wasn't really playing early in the game. So I don't like, I'm not, I'm not trying to find new ways to invest in the bears offense right now. Right? (laughs) Like I just don't, (laughs) just don't, I don't see it. Yeah. What's rough too is. Week two, Tampa Bay. I think that defense still has a lot going for it. Yeah. Week three, Kansas City, Denver, Washington. Like, there's not a lot of like, it's not as if they turn around right away in week two, week three, week four, week five, and just get like, all right, these are our get right cupcake games. Like, we could be, I hate to say it because I think Justin Fields seems like a great guy and all that, but like, and I mean, I enjoyed talking to him the couple times I have before. We could be like by week six thinking like, all right, maybe the Bears just are drafting number one overall and they have the Panthers yeah. pick and like we're trying to, you know, do they like, do the Caleb Williams stuff. I hate to say it, but I think that's within the range of outcomes. At this oh, point. it absolutely is that, um, you know, I had the conversation a number, number of times about fields like the The nice thing about him as a as a fantasy pick last year is that like it, if it didn't work out, you could just move on because he was a ninth round, 10th round, 11th round pick. But like, you, I mean, he was your fourth round pick this year. You yeah, I'd be, I'd be I'd be worried. Yeah, it's too big to fail. Uh, All right. I got to get this one in because it's hilarious just the way it was sent in. At Todd underscore Pierce, I could use a glass of Chardonnay (laughs) right now. I mean, one, well done. Uh, Two, Andy, what are you like from a wine drinking perspective? Where would you where would you put yourself? Are you like a wine guy or what? Oh, yeah. I I like a nice dry Chardonnay. Sure. (laughs) I actually don't really like Chardonnay that much. It's not. But like I have. My wife has converted me to like a. We've become like full. We when we met, we were young and like, yeah. Well, let's just drink IPAs until you know three <laughs> in the morning. Now we're like, all right, let's go on wine tours in Charlottesville. So I this this one spoke to me. Never, still not the biggest Chardonnay guy, but I gotta love the pun here, uh, Todd Pierce. I don't think Zach Charbonnet is like our first guy that we need to panic about in fantasy because like, okay, he was probably a flyer pick for you. But I want to use this to say. Seahawks offense level of panic. Where are you at? I'm a little concerned as somebody that really liked the Seahawks offense and thought, wow, week one against the, you know, Matthew Stafford and the kids yeah. there in Los or let me, let me say it better because he's a defensive player, Aaron Donald and the kids. And they, they can have a nice week one. Aaron Donald kicked their ass in week yeah. one and just Gino didn't look. I mean, there was the a viral clip of him going, oh, my God, is Aaron, which I don't blame him. I mean, I would say a lot worse than just, oh, my God, if Aaron Donald was closing in on me. Not a great performance from Gino. 
you know, DK Metcalf, he gets the touchdown. Wouldn't say it was the perfect game for him. Tyler Lockett left with injuries. JSN wasn't really fully uh, unleashed just yet. Is it a little too early to be worried that I am holding too much Seahawks stock, or should it should we be panicking? I will I will say that I was mostly impressed with the Rams coming out of that game. Yeah. Um, de- defensively, offensively, Stafford looked fantastic. Um, and it's a little bit of it was, you know, if you're disappointed in Geno, it's it's probably because of how freaking awesome uh, Stafford's arm looked. Uh, I thought I thought he was just great. Um, I, I also don't like, I don't think Gino was fluky last year. I saw a little bit of, mm, you no, know, yes, I saw a little bit of that on Twitter after the game, during the game, Gino turning back into a pumpkin or whatever. Like Gino was really good last year. That wasn't just, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't fluky. That wasn't accidental. He played great. Those receivers are still great. I'm not, I'm not panicky about it. You, you also probably took, you know, it, you probably didn't take Gino as your only quarterback. If you did, it's usually easy to move on in a one quarterback league. But I don't think that's I don't think that's going to be a, a huge going forward problem. I think they got, you know, sucker punched is the wrong phrase. But like, I don't I don't think they expected what they were what they eventually got from from the Rams uh, defensively, offensively, any of it. Um, and they couldn't keep pace with a with a super fun uh, Rams offense either. So it's a it's a worry. I mean, I wouldn't like if uh, like if I had Charbonnet, I would have had zero plans for him in week one. Oh, uh, yeah, as soon please. as soon as we knew that Walker was going to be good to go, like I don't like I wouldn't have played him. Um, I maybe maybe you're in a 16 team league, something like that, and you had to play him. But I I I would not have touched him. He was always a he was always a long term investment. That run game didn't. That I will say that run game is more troubling, I think, than the pass game. They they just consistently don't put themselves in favorable down and distances like too often. You know, before you get like the big Kenneth Walker run. But um, all right, Andy, we're gonna do your waiver wire rankings. But just before we we get out of here, anyone else that was on the list that that you got a, a lot of, or or that you we want to hit on from a panic meter standpoint before we move on to the waivers. Um, I would be interested in your take on Jameer Gibbs from uh, from Thursday night because there was a right that there, happened right yeah there was a there was a game on Thursday it feels like a billion years ago at this point because welcome back to the NFL where that's a thing because I thought like I thought he his best plays were awesome his worst play was obviously falling down when he had a chance to score a touchdown but like his, his best runs were super flashy I thought he was great I do think it is a little bit of a going forward problem that um, Gibbs was a pure backup right like he if you if you'd imagined a scenario where Gibbs owns the and I I had kind of done this where Gibbs sort of owns the passing work he gets third down he gets two minutes something like that he didn't have any of that he didn't have you know there's no like single role that belongs to him just yet they also like the coaching staff made some noises afterward about how oh yeah we're easing him in we're gonna ramp up his usage but that's also just that's just a thing you say um, yeah that I don't, might I, be true might be true. Yeah, that's but that's what's hard about it. Like it could be the truth, but it is also the thing that you would say anyway. Um, <laughs> like he, he was he was fine. He was good. He was pretty backup y though. Uh, and and coaches love David Montgomery and David Montgomery is always available and he played well enough. Um, not I'm not going to say that David Montgomery is super flashy, anything like that. Goodness knows I've, I've seen plenty of him over the years, um, but he. But he played well, and he's he's also the guy who's like super hard charging, doesn't doesn't miss the hole that is blocked, doesn't you know doesn't give away any yards. Um, and coaches coaches love that, and I think he's going to be quite an obstacle for Gibbs. And I, I I hope we get to a place where Gibbs is getting like fifty percent of those snaps, but we're clearly not there yet. We are not there yet. Uh, I will say, you know, hearkening back to our or my conversation with Chris Harris on the podcast in the preseason where we talked about Jameer Gibbs. I I liked Jameer Gibbs and I liked the idea of Jameer Gibbs, but everyone else liked it a lot more than me, right? Yeah. Like I remember when my ranking early rankings came out and somebody's like, man, ah, man, you're really down on Jameer Gibbs. I'm like, am I? Am I? I have him as like running back 20 or running back 19, but relative to ADP, that was very down on Jameer Gibbs. And for me, it was Dave Montgomery's going to have a role. It's going to be a role that I think is a little more nebulous. And I think ultimately why they chose to go with Dave Montgomery and like lock him in before and then just basically say goodbye to Jamal Williams was that I think David Montgomery can do a little bit more of both than Jamal Williams can. So that's, I think, the biggest problem for Jameer Gibbs coming out of this is that 
Dave Montgomery isn't going to lose that role and his role is going to overlap more with Jameer Gibbs. Now they couldn't be two more like different players, you know, from a running back standpoint. And yeah. Jameer Gibbs has so much more juice than Dave Montgomery, but Dave Montgomery's not bad. You could probably argue that he's better than Jamal Williams or at least just more versatile. And some of that is going to overlap with Jameer Gibbs. And again, you heard me say that clearly I was a little skeptical that Gibbs was going to be at least that he was again, I'm not out on Jameer Gibbs at all or anything, but it just relative to ADP, I was always priced out because people had a higher aspirations. I would at least be coming out of week one, like heat checking those high aspirations if I had them. That being said, the coaching staff says that, you know, they're going to ramp him up as the year goes on. And if Jameer Gibbs has eight catches for 78 yards and a touchdown against the Seahawks in week two, I don't think you'd be surprised by that. I just think it might be a little bit more variable um, than we might have imagined. Yeah, I, I think that's probably right. And I'm not I'm not suggesting there's any reason to panic, but um, it, I thought it was pretty notable that on Friday morning there were um, there there were definitely like analysts that were that were framing it as just a triumph of a night for Jameer Gibbs. Right. Just a just an absolute because I don't know, you can you can like you can clip his best run and it went for 18 yards and he makes like yeah. five guys miss. And it's great. And, um, y- you know, I, I guess you can I guess you can victory lap that. But I, I did think it was problematic that he's in a he's in a pure backup role right now. It's it's still like a sizable role. It's not like it's not like he's getting ten percent of the snaps or anything like that. But it is it is an obstacle to overcome. And I'm a, I'm not panicky about it, but I, I'm a little concerned. I don't have a ton of Gibbs. I don't. I I was I was higher on him than you were, but I wasn't. You know, I wasn't the person who. I wasn't the person who was ever making the case that, oh, Jameer Gibbs can finish as the RB3, the RB5, or anything like that. I didn't really see that in his range of outcomes. Um, so I don't have a ton of him, but I have enough that I'm I'm concerned. Definitely, I think concern is warranted. Maybe not full panic, but concern is warranted. All right, Andy, every week we are going to get into your top five-ish, top five-ish waiver pickups here. Uh, I want to go from from five to one here, maybe make this more of a big reveal. So um, look, we here's the deal with waivers, guys. You could pick up anybody. OK, we could sit here and run through everybody and give you a fab percentage and all that. It, it's just so variable to uh, different leagues. And, you know, Andy and I were joking about this before we got started on the podcast today. If you think you need to tweet so, uh, to at Andy after this and be like, hey, you didn't talk about insert player here. Why didn't you talk about insert player here in the players to pick up segment? Maybe a little context clues there might might be able to tell you why <laughs> Andy did not talk about them <laughs> in the pickup section. But get us started here uh, with your f- number five ranked player to pick up heading into week two. Yeah, I'll I'll preface this by saying that I'm I'm not going to talk about Jordan Love, and it's not because you know it's not because I don't want to relive that game anymore. Although I don't want to relive that game anymore, it's just I don't. I don't see a pressing need out there for anybody to add a quarterback. So I want to focus on on receivers and running backs. We obviously have some glaring needs around the league uh, and and around the fantasy landscape at running back. So we're going to focus there. Um, I think my number five would be and th- this could end up being this could end up being a whiff, but I'm going to I'm going to make a Josh Kelly. Um, OK, Kelly was a. Kelly was a, a a real part of what the Chargers did on Sunday. I don't know that that's going to last going forward. I, I I certainly hope that Austin Eckler is absolutely fine. We'll probably figure that out within the next couple of days. Um, Josh Josh Kelly carried 16 times for 90 plus yards, had a touchdown, um, and was a big part of what they did. And they've liked him like they've liked him since he came into the building. So it it was at the very worst. It's a reminder that Kelly is somebody who could have pretty significant. You know, he has pretty significant contingent value. And if he has a if he has a, a like a standalone role in a great offense, um, that's pretty good. That's pretty appealing. He's definitely somebody who should be rostered in a lot more leagues. Um, so he's he's number five for me. That's kind of a it's kind of a hesitant number five. My number four. I'm going to I'm going to call it and this is not a this is not a ringing endorsement of the player over the full season but I think the second Zach Moss comes back he's going to he's going to just dominate that Colts backfield for however long it takes for the at least for the Jonathan Taylor fiasco to to get resolved um cuz Deion Deion Jackson just had a, a disaster of a game um couple Oof. of fumbles he averaged about one and a half yards per touch um, it was bad. Like everything else was pretty fun about the Colts offense too. Like Richardson was, Richardson was, was good. That was, that was really, really fun. He was fun as a runner. Um, and he hit a lot of, he hit a lot of short, easy stuff that was good to see. Um, but Deion Jackson was notably bad. 
and I, Moss returned to practice uh, last week. So I, I have, you know, I have little doubt that he should be able to return in week two. And if he does, I think he's just going to take that over. He's a pretty efficient runner last year. He's not super flashy, but he's another one of those guys who like gets the yards that are there. Um, and, and I think he's going to be fine for that team. And I, I don't, I don't think there's any way they go forward with Deion Jackson. My number three is going to be Kyron Williams. Um, and in a man, in a lot of weeks, he might be the number one because, uh, the Rams surprised us. Um, but we, we talked about this earlier in the show. Like it was a, it was a really rough week for all of those running backs, um, where the argument to draft them was, Hey, they don't have anybody else. Um, cause Kyron Williams turned out to be the, the, anybody else, uh, in, in the Rams backfield. Um, and, and also a reminder that like last season we came into the year and there, and there was a, there was a fair amount of buzz about Kyron Williams and the team liked him and, and boy, he's going to have a role and then he gets, and then he gets injured like on the first special team snap of the season. We don't see him for several weeks. I believe it was a high ankle sprain. Um, and then they got him involved again when he came back and sure enough, like the, the snap share there was 65% for Kyron Williams, 35% for Cam Akers. Akers did kind of save his day with a touchdown. Weirdly, Akers actually led all running backs in, in week one in total carries, but he got 29 yards on 22 carries. Um, he did get into the end zone, but Kyron got there twice. Um, I think that's pretty clearly Kyron's job. Um, we talked about it earlier, like the, the, um, you know, the Rams have a tough matchup next week. It's the Niners. That's not great. Uh, but like going forward, he, he's pretty clearly the number one there. Now I don't want to spend another season, like throwing fab resources at Rams running backs, like we did last year, but I would, you know, the way it sets up right now, I would definitely go after Kyron. I think number two on this list needs to be Kenny Gainwell, who again, just, just dominated the the backfield work for the Eagles. It wasn't close. Swift had two touches, three yards. Rashad Penny didn't play. Um, there's no case for anybody other than Gainwell there. I, th I thought it was going to be like a murky three-headed committee. Gainwell was the whole committee. Um, we don't know that it's going to look like that in November, but it looks like it right now. And it's the freaking Eagles. So you just got to jump on it, right? Like the, the possibility is there for Kenny Gainwell to be the lead back for the Philadelphia Eagles all there, you got to jump on it. Um, he's widely available. He's available in over 50% of Yahoo leagues. And then my number one is the rookie receiver who got 15 targets. I mean, Puka Nakua got 15 targets, caught 10 of them, over 100 yards, a lot of short range stuff in which he looked great. A fantastic catch on like a on like a deep 20 yard out from Matthew Stafford. Stafford was actually like, uh, of all of all the players who like really opened my it's, it seems stupid to say about a veteran quarterback but of all the players that really opened my eyes in week one it was like Stafford really did like that was vintage Matthew Stafford that was that was like the old throwing arm um and all the concerns about Stafford coming into this season of course were related to the elbow and how healthy is he going to be is he going to hold up man he looked good um and he found something with Tutu Atwell he found something with Nakua Nakua is somebody who never, never really had like a, a huge college season, but on a, on a per route basis, on a per play basis was an absolute superstar. Um, the Rams talked him up a lot in the summer and wow, did he look the part. Um, eventually Cooper cup returns. And that is, that is certainly a problem for Nakua, but he is also somebody who can compliment him really well. It seems pretty clear that he's just going to be a PPR starter moving forward. You know, your words and Cooper cup returns could be like, ah, oh, yeah, he's not going to have, you know, by the way, Pukunukua might never see 15 targets again the rest yeah. of the season. So it's like, okay, he might not have 15 target games when Cooper Cup gets back. But Cooper Cup might eventually be coming back to this offense. And my takeaway from your top five here, and it's easy to say this, and we can close the show on this note because there's two freaking Rams players in your top five. You know, we spend a lot of summer, a lot of summer time talking about like who's going to be the value offense in fantasy. I, I <laughs> look like an idiot for saying that the damn Steelers might be that offense. Maybe it's the Rams. Maybe the Rams yeah. and and like they're not even going to be a discount. They're going to be like the crap your neighbor was th is throwing out on the curb <laughs> offense basically once you take you know, when you, if you take, obviously Cam Akers might be the worst of it, but he was the only guy to kind of taken early. And then there's the Cooper Cup thing, obviously. But nobody was beating you down to draft Van Jefferson. Puka Nakua is like basically complete. Scott called him hiding in plain sight. You know, yeah. Tutu Atwell looked really good. And obviously Stafford and you know, Higby is a decent little fill in at tight end. They get a ton of volume because these good receivers are there now. But I I'm definitely coming out of week one thinking like, yeah, we might have all. You know, they have a hard opponent week two, like you said, but we might be, have all just 
underrated the fact that the Rams, like Sean McVay's a good, really, really, really good coach. And and he's not just a guy that like, you know, he, he won the Super Bowl because they had a – obviously he won the Super Bowl. They had a bunch of good players. But this dude came from nowhere and came to a Jeff Fisher wrecked team and rebuilt the program <laughs> and built an offense like – out of, you know, got, Robert Woods was kind of a cast off from the Bills, you know, like they made him into a feature player. Like we have a lot of evidence that Sean McVay is very, very, very good at this. And Matthew Stafford is very, very, very good at this. And I kind of like going back and, you know, remembering some of the headlines from Rams training camp that Sean McVay was like gassed up to work with this young offense. And I mean, Matthew Stafford, there was a whole thing made of it that he didn't know anybody on the team or, you know, didn't know how to connect with anybody on the team. They were all um, on their phones all the time. They're all on their right. phones all the time. The people made a huge deal out of that. But McVay has always built really, really good programs and really, really connected teams. And Stafford, at least like, Hey, you know what? He seems to have connected with these guys, okay? Like, yeah. <laughs> he seems to have been... And they, they've got Tutu Atwell, who's, you know, like freaking, you know, he probably weighs as much as you, Andy, and you're, <laughs> you know, six seven and and, and a, a sprinter or whatever you are. So, like, you know, he's real thin, okay? Uh, and and Pukunuku is a day three draft pick. Pukunuku is a damn good player, okay? He fell through the cracks. That was just... He was good. I'm look, coming out of this thinking like, you know, and Kyron Williams, I, I we did a pickups video and I was like, I don't know if I'm running to the waiver wire and I'm desperate to pick him up. I'm kind of like you where I don't want to come back in a couple of weeks and be rolling my eyes for dropping like 40 percent of my fab on uh, a, a part time back on, on this offense. But I am at least coming out of week one. And one of my priors I am challenging is that we all as an industry and I don't I you know, normally there's it's the royal we. And, and, you know, nobody is talking about it is a stupid thing to say. But I don't remember very many people in the fantasy space being like, hey, the Rams sleeping giant on offense. Right. And maybe they're not. But I'm at least challenging my priors on this unit. Uh, also, there was a there was a fair amount of reporting on on what a what a normal, healthy offseason Matthew Stafford had. And I feel like collectively we just didn't want to hear it <laughs> like I, I i feel bad too because i i remember reading it a handful of times and then i'd look at my ranks and i was like eh, i'm yeah. fine with where i have him i never budged him i i just thought he looked fantastic in opening so week good. i thought it was great to see um and it was you know uh, you know i embedded a couple of I embedded a couple of clips in the in the pickups article about nakua that you know were were highlights uh, ostensibly about Nakua, but man, Stafford made some throws. Um, and if if he can like if he can hold up, and again, like he had a he had a a, a really quiet, really healthy, really productive off season, and then it just got murky at the end because there were the funny stories about him not relating to young people. Um, but uh, like if he's just going to be this guy all year, and he, you know, he didn't have a noisy fantasy day because all the touchdowns went to running backs. But three hundred thirty four yards and just looked like 25 year old Matthew Stafford doing it. I, I just thought he was, I thought he was fantastic. He's going to have huge days going forward. If this is really, if this is really the guy he's going to be this season. Last thing here, uh, just any lean on the Ravens running backs. Uh, Cause I know people will ask about that. And again, make sure you, if you are looking for more answers, read Andy's pickups column on the website. This is just a mere little taste of the pickup. So please go and, and do that. But any lean on the Ravens backs, uh, John Harbaugh said today, like we're good. We like the guys we have. Melvin Gordon's here for a reason. He's a proven back, and I'm very, very glad he's here. So I don't think they're about to go and sign Leonard Fournette or something like that. Although that is a move that the Ravens have historically done before. Yes. But I think the fact that Gordon's there kind of he, – he, they've already done it. They've preempted their uh, veteran running back ad here in Melvin Gordon. But, you know, so there's Melvin Gordon. There's Justice Hill. There's Gus Edwards. Any lean here in replacing J.K. Dobbins? Yeah, I feel like there's going to be a handful of people that chase the the touchdowns from Justice Hill. Um, Gus Edwards also had a two point conversion. Like they just they split the carries after um, after uh, just a brutal injury to to Dobbins. Feel terrible about it. Those two split the carries. It's it probably looks like that next week and moving forward. We know that team loves Gus Edwards. Um, and, and Hill had a, uh, by all accounts, really productive off season earned, earned more playing time. He was getting it alongside Dobbins. Um, so it's probably those two and Melvin is sprinkled in. And then like, the, I'm just, I'm just not excited to make an ad here. Like I'll probably, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to start making like waiver claims and, and fab bids. And those guys are going to be pretty far down on the list. Um, 
and I'm I'm gonna I don't know I'm gonna put the same number on both Gus Edwards and Justice Hill. I don't I I barely differentiate between them. Um, I'm not that excited about it because this is a situation where I think it's going to be a pretty murky committee, and more often than not, it's going to look just like it's going to look just like Sunday, and Lamar Jackson's going to lead the team in rushing. Um, and you're really just hoping that you got a touchdown out of out of one of those guys. So I don't, I don't think anybody. I think everybody's ceiling there is kind of like flex in a deep league. All right. Well, that is going to do it for this show. Andy, I think we had a successful debut of the people's panic meter. I don't know if we solved anyone's panicking, but we at least <laughs> we at least uh, talked about it. We at least maybe you know, maybe maybe people feel, maybe people feel better. I love that the whole goal is just to, is just to tell you exactly how much that you should panic and we can't really resolve anything for you. I mean, good luck. <laughs> good luck. All right. Well, that is going to do it for this show on Wednesday. I will be back. Eckler's Edge is back. Austin Eckler will be back. That's what the show implies, uh, that he is going to be a part of it. We got a new segment to reveal. Very excited about that. So make sure you tune in. Also, if you want to be featured on next week's People's Panic Meter Fantasy mailbag at yahoosports.com. That's where you submit your panic. Again, you could do this thing when you're, you know, half in the bag on Sunday. Okay, send in a voicemail to to the to the to the email. Okay, it's recommended. that would actually do it's that. Rec- yeah, it is recommended. Don't wait for Monday morning, especially no. we, we we taped this show on Monday. So the earlier you can get them in, the better. That's the best way to do it. Andy and I are also going to tweet about it, so make sure you keep up with it. Then again, like I said, Wednesday. Equus Edge is back. New segment. A lot of exciting stuff. Until then, we're out.